Hello everyone, thank you for joining me today. My name is Michael and I'm the minister at Hoon Hay Presbyterian Church in Christchurch. I have another message in the Salt Shaker series that will start with the scriptures. And the first scripture I've chosen from the New Living Translation is Jonah chapter 2 verses 1 to 10. Then Jonah prayed to the Lord his God from inside the fish. He said, I cried out to the Lord in my great trouble, and he answered me. I called to you from the land of the dead, and Lord, you heard me. You threw me into the ocean depths, and I sank down to the heart of the sea. The mighty waters engulfed me. I was buried beneath your wild and stormy waves. Then I said, O Lord, you have driven me from your presence, yet I will look once more toward your holy temple. I sank beneath the waves, and the waters closed over me. Seaward wrapped itself around my head. I sank down to the very roots of the mountains. I was imprisoned in the earth, whose gates lock shut forever. But you, O Lord my God, snatched me from the jaws of death. As my life was slipping away, I remembered the Lord, and my earnest prayer went out to you in your holy temple. Those who worship false gods turn their backs on all God's mercies. But I will offer sacrifices to you with songs of praise, and I will fulfill all my vows. For my salvation comes from the Lord alone. Then the Lord ordered the fish to spit Jonah out onto the beach. And the second reading is from Luke chapter 18, verses 1 to 8, also reading from the New Living Translation. The parable of the persistent widow. One day Jesus told his disciples a story to show that they should always pray and never give up. There was a judge in a certain city, he said, who neither feared God nor cared about people. A widow of that city came to him repeatedly saying, Give me justice in this dispute with my enemy. The judge ignored her for a while, but finally he said to himself, I don't fear God or care about people, but this woman is driving me crazy. I'm going to see that she gets justice because she's wearing me out with her constant requests. Then the Lord said, learn a lesson from this unjust judge. Even he rendered a just decision in the end. So don't you think God will surely give justice to his chosen people who cry out to him day and night? Will he keep putting them off? I tell you, he will grant justice to them quickly. But when the Son of Man returns, how many will he find on earth who have faith. And may the Lord add his favour and blessing to those readings from his word. I resume the Salt Shaker series today, this time considering the theme of sovereignty, or more specifically the sovereignty of God in reverential prayer. Given the events of the last couple of weeks, talking about sovereignty seems appropriate. Queen Elizabeth II died, as we know, aged 96, following 70 years on the throne. And what a spectacle the grieving and funeral preparation have been. We have been witnessing both continuity and change at the same time. Continuity in the maintenance of centuries old traditions but change in Charles, the Queen's son, becoming king, and the inevitable reigniting, no doubt, of the Republican debate in Commonwealth countries. For me, the pomp and protocol were impressive enough, but even more so was the genuine outpouring of grief in Britain and around the world. Both as a person and what she stood for mattered intensely to so many people and there's nothing faked about scenes like this here or this scene 
millions of people, ordinary people, paying their respects. Whole roadways in London festooned with flowers and people all around the world doing just what this woman here is doing. The world was remembering a remarkable life that was very well lived. And it was a 24-7 event for days on end, especially in London. Here's the scene outside Buckingham Palace. Looking at pictures like this, I think just, just what is it or was it about the Queen that elicited such a response? I don't think we have to look too far to find some answers. All of Elizabeth's life had been on public display. And almost everybody would agree on these virtues that she embodied. Loyalty, impartiality, decency, constancy, service and integrity. But let's not forget her faith. Underpinning all of these qualities was the most important of all. It was her personal faith in Jesus Christ. She was an earthly monarch. But she lived her life with respect to and in worship of the heavenly monarch, Jesus Christ, the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. Here's what Justin Welby, the Archbishop of Canterbury, said at the funeral in Westminster Abbey. The Queen, he said, began her coronation with silent prayer just there at the high altar, which was beside him. Her allegiance to God was given before any person gave allegiance to her. Her service to so many people in this nation, the Commonwealth and the world, had its foundation in her following Christ, God himself, who said that he came not to be served, but to serve and to give his life a ransom for many. Away from the public gaze, the Queen was a woman of deep faith and prayer. She knew that being a credible witness depended on her relationship with God in prayer. For the Queen and for us as individuals and together in the church, reverential prayer is like fuel to a car. We need it because without it, we can't function. And reverential prayer focuses on the nature and character of God, his person, his works, his revelation and triune being. It's the only place from which to understand prayer. Here's an approach which you may or may not be familiar with. It's called the ACTS approach to prayer. And this is not a formula or a prescription, but I like it because it begins in the right place with awe, reverence and respect of God for who he is and not for what we want. We praise the Lord for being the awesome God that he is. Adoration. The shorter Westminster Catechism says what is or asks the question, what is the chief end of man? And the answer comes, the chief end of man is to glorify God and enjoy him forever. And the psalmists knew this. For example, Psalm 107 speaks of uh, affirming who God is. The psalmist articulating, proclaiming who God is. Many of the psalms do that. They focus on the nature and character of God. So we see here in the Acts approach, that we come to God out of awe and respect for who he is before we may move to things like confession and thanksgiving and supplication, which is really a word of praying for ourselves or others. I want to suggest that this is a disposition and posture of the soul, often in spite of and not because of our circumstances. And when it's practiced as a personal and corporate discipline, it will naturally lead to personal and petitioning prayer. Most importantly, though, it will do so in a biblical order. The glory of God 
is first in worship. And sometimes it takes some really hard circumstances for us to get to this point. It doesn't need to, but often it does. The prophet Jonah was certainly in a hard place. That's an understatement. He knew God's call in his life, but was slow to obey. God called him to preach to the Assyrian city of Nineveh, which lay at the very heart of Israel's enemy. Now, we mostly, I think, know the story of Jonah. He was swallowed by a whale and then spat up. Um, liberal scholars who have real difficulty seeing the truth in biblical stories uh, reduce this to a beautiful allegory, just a nice story. But actually, Jesus referred to this story, the story of Jonah in Matthew and Luke, and it could happen. This incident was placed alongside the greater miracle of his own resurrection, which when you think about it, is also pretty improbable. Improbable to the rational mind, certainly, but the creator alone can suspend normal physical laws and principles and events for supernatural and divine purposes. If you are the creator of the universe, you can uh, alter the normal laws of creation. So Nineveh was an Assyrian city of 120,000 people, and Jonah's task was to call this, this city to repentance. Now, normally, the gastric juices of, of a whale would quickly dissolve anything that was swallowed, but this is a supernatural event in which God preserves Jonah's life, and then he is ready for his task. So in the passage which was read, um, Jonah comes to a realisation of where he was and uh, he felt that he was in the realm of the dead, which in Hebrew is Sheol, or we might call hell. He's gone down literally to the very depths of the earth and he was in a hard place, but he cries out. And our reverential prayer of God, just like the psalmist's, we need to cry out too, but we do so no matter what our circumstances in a prayer of thanksgiving. Jonah desperately needed deliverance and often we too desperately need deliverance. But despite being swallowed by the whale, he wasn't drowned. This story, among many others in scripture, reminds us that our predicament is never too difficult for God. Jonah's losing all hope but he turns his attention to God and he experiences a miraculous deliverance we see in verse 10. But in our reverential prayer, we don't have to wait for such trying circumstances. In Luke 18, 1 to 8, it's a parable. Um, Jesus reminds his listeners to always be in an attitude of prayer. God wants our worship and also for us, a bit like Jonah, to plead for his power and presence in our circumstances. Our requests should be constantly before God as we live for him day by day. And these requests should not just be endless repetition or painfully long prayers, but issuing from, starting from, a reverence for and a relationship with God. And how do we do that? Well, we use scripture. We focus on God's great acts. It's what the psalmists did all the time. And I think of Psalm 121, where the, the, the writer lifts his head to see the hills. Now, there's the hills, many people think hills and mountains are sacred. But I think in this psalm, it's really saying just lift your gaze beyond where you are at and you will get a different perspective. And that's hard to do because often we don't feel like it. It is an exercise of the soul to decide and persist to focus on God's great acts in creation. This is what the psalmists did. They talked about creation, Psalm 19. They talked about the Exodus. They talked about God revealing his perfect law on Mount Sinai and his faithfulness to provide for Israel and so on. Prayer with wisdom 
comes first from immersing ourselves in God's word. We need to know who we are praying to, and then we'll be careful and wise and wise in what we pray and how we pray. Often we come to God casually and we pray gimme gimme prayers, a shopping list of wants and desires. And that's really when you think about that, hurrying into God's presence uh, with our shopping list, so to speak, is not reverential prayer. It's probably uh, understandable in certain situations, arrow prayers of great need, but real prayer starts with deep reverence for God. I often say uh, we can rush into God's presence. God is almighty and not almighty. And we often uh, miss the reverence and the importance of reverential prayer and coming to God in the right mindset. Psalm 121 also tells us in verse 4 that God never dozes or sleeps. So his power and presence are constant. What is decisive for us is the exercise of the soul um, to desire and practice the presence of God. Now here's an interesting and I think uh, worthwhile diagram. When we're talking about aspects of, of, of what it means to be human, body, soul and spirit. Body, soul and spirit are distinguishable, but they're actually indivisible. So they're all wrapped up together, but for the purposes of discernment, uh, we can speak of them separately. So this diagram, the doing is the action. It's when we have thought to do something, we feel strongly to do it, and we do it. So the will, the doing, the feeling, and the thinking. These aspects of the soul are the I of our being. Whenever we use that word I, we are in the realm of the soul, our unique personality. And our soul has to be yielded in submission to God. It's the price to be paid for spiritual growth and transformation. Reverential prayer is based on contemplation of God's nature, character, revelation and works. And the Psalms in particular have led me to consider and ponder these aspects. I've been practicing the presence of God uh, in recent weeks and um, a verse that's really come to me is Psalm 19 verse 7, which I've really been slowly working through and considering. It says, the law of the Lord is perfect, converting the soul. The testimony of the Lord is sure, making wise the simple. Now, the word converting there certainly means salvation, but I think it also means bringing the soul into proper alignment with God's plans and purposes and his person and his presence. So when I think about the law of the Lord, I think about these things. Obviously the law that was revealed to Moses, which is immutable and eternal, but the insights of the law that I gain when I think about it, about God, myself, my circumstances and my world. The law of the Lord is perfect. It is wisdom. It is applied truth that's not just knowing things, but then doing them. The law of the Lord is perfect. It includes his principles, what underpins uh, everything that God is and does. The law of the Lord is perfect. It is truth, conceptually, legally, and it's embodied in the person of Jesus Christ. And when I um, take on his righteousness, I am living in truth and light. The law of the Lord is perfect in relation to his precepts. A precept is a commandment or instruction or guiding rule. I get drawn into the life of God when I meditate on his perfect law. And so these are just some aspects that I've been 
reflecting on as I've really dwelt on scriptures like this. And of course, all of the Old Testament, what we call the Old Testament, points to Christ. Christ is the living word. John 14, 6, he says, I am the way, the truth and the life. So all of the law of the Lord is embodied in Christ, who is God in human form. So I've found this really helpful. This is an approach for me, and I share it with you, to be drawn into meditating on the scriptures. There's just one scripture and how uh, I've unpacked it that's been useful in my life. So this coming week, a challenge is to exercise and discipline the soul to intentionally seek and encounter God as sovereign in reverential prayer. The scriptures exhort us to do this. Hebrews 12, 28 says, for example, since we are receiving a kingdom that cannot be destroyed, let us be thankful and please God by worshipping him with holy fear and awe. So what, is that, what might that look like to pause in our daily lives, to find a quiet space, to encounter God in the quiet, the beauty of holiness, to ponder, uh, just like I've been doing with that, that Psalm 19 verse 7 scripture, but many, many others, or whatever we feel led to, to pause, to ponder, and then to ask God to reveal himself to us. It is an exercise, an act of the soul. It takes discipline. It's where we discipline and yield our soul to say, I will come before the Lord in reverential prayer. prayer. And if we do, it's actually the best place to be. Now, it's not a physical place. It could be anywhere. Uh, as we saw with Jonah, it could be in the darkest and most dire of circumstances. But it's where our whole being, body, soul and spirit is in alignment with God. It is truly the best place that we can be to hear from God. In our devotional and church life, the adoring contemplation of God is, I think, largely a lost art. But it, it's one that needs to be rediscovered. It is actually, when you think about it, it is the most important thing that we can do. It's relatively easy to talk about God's grace. And it can be an abstraction rather than a life-changing, transforming power inside us. But to be God's people in the church we first have to have these truths genuinely embedded deep in our body, soul and spirit. Uh, when we do, it creates a bedrock faith in God. So there we are. There's some thoughts on sovereignty, sovereignty and reverential prayer. I hope and pray that they have been helpful for you. And I look forward to uh, having your company again in the next installment in the Salt Shaker series. Thank you very much and God bless.